Now I am going to introduce, as I mentioned, our representative from UNC Press this evening. He's a member of their Advancement Council, and it's Kirk Brown, who has been with us several times before. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and bring Kirk up and welcome Kirk. It's great to see you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Kirk, uh, technically the Reverend David C., Brown, uh, known as Kirk, uh, received his AB from Davidson College, his MA from the University of Virginia, and his Master's of Divinity from Virginia Theological Seminary. He's a lifelong educator. Having taught German and English for 12 years at Virginia Episcopal School, he then attended seminary and was ordained an Episcopal priest. After serving three years at St. John's Church in Roanoke, Virginia, he returned to schoolwork, serving 24 years as chaplain at Christ School here in Asheville and teaching religion. Kirk lives with his wife, Shelley. Hi, Shelley, on a farm in Fletcher. Welcome, Kirk. Stephanie, thank you so much. Um, and thanks to Malaprops for this ongoing partnership and your hospitality. It always floors me and um, I feel so humbled by that. Um, this month alone, Malaprops is going to be hosting three such UNC Press uh, Presents evening sessions. Um, week after next, uh, a book on what's called Crimigration. Uh, the week after that, a new UNC Press publication, uh, Country Capitalism. So if you're interested in this evening's uh, presentation, please tune in again. Thank you for that, Eric. Yeah. So as Stephanie mentioned, um, I'm a member of the UNC Press Advancement Council. And I want to take just a moment to tell you why I love this press uh, so much. Um, I don't think anything... That, there is any other institution quite like it in the state. Um, what UNC Press does for North Carolina is in many ways incalculable. Through its numerous awards and reviews, its amazing catalog of titles, and its sterling reputation, the name of the press is carried around our state, across the country, and truly around the globe. Last year, the press celebrated its centennial. So its first 100 years of publishing books for the academy, as well as books for the people of North Carolina and for the region. On average, the UNC Press publishes books at a, the rate of three or four, one every three or four days for a total of about 120 to 125 every year. But whether it's a scholarly monograph or a title intended for general audiences, each UNC Press title undergoes rigorous peer review process, which in itself is a hallmark of university press publishing. So these are quality books. Well over half win awards each year. Awards such as the National Book Award, the Pulitzer Prize for History, and the Bancroft Prize. As part of the state's great public university system, the press serves the people of the state by publishing books across the spectrum. Tonight's book is a book that I am particularly excited about. Uh, we've been waiting for this release for a long, long time, <laughs> but it's a new history of the American South. An incredible work. And truly, I, I've only been able to read the first few chapters, but it's just an amazing and a groundbreaking work. So you've heard enough from me. I want to introduce the authors who are with us tonight. We have tonight with us the chief editor of this volume, W. Fitzhugh Brundage, and one of the contributors um, uh, to the history itself, Michael McDonald. Fitz Brundage is the William B. Umstead Professor of History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His books include The Southern Past, A Clash of Race and Memory, and Civilizing Torture, an American Tradition. Mike McDonald is a professor of history at the University of Sydney. His books include Masters of Empire, Great Lakes Indians, and the Making of America and the politics of war, race, class, and conflict in revolutionary Virginia. 
I'm so excited. I want to turn things over. And perhaps I should start with a question, Fitz, that I'll direct to you, which is, why did you take on such a daunting project as this? And how did it come to be the magnificent volume that we have before us now? Uh, first, let me just say, I'm thrilled to participate in this event. One, to see Mike. I haven't seen Mike since COVID. So it's great to see Mike, but it's also wonderful to participate in an event at a bookstore that I truly love. I've been saying to everybody, I was disappointed that I'm not actually in Asheville in the bookstore because I just love the bookstore. But to answer your question, uh, honestly, the invitation to edit this volume came from a wonderful editor at the University of North Carolina Press, Chuck Grinch, a long time ago, two decades ago. And he wanted to get started on a new history of the South, asked me to edit it so that it would come out in time for the press's centennial. We thought we had lots of time, but life happens. I had other projects that I had to finish. And we actually didn't really get started on the volume until 2015, 2016. And we made fairly good progress, but I would say COVID definitely slowed us down for a variety of reasons. One of the biggest challenges of the volume was of course, to find the right type of authors. Uh, we were looking for people who wrote really well, who were very creative and who would work collaboratively. And that was a, that's, those aren't necessarily skills that every academic has. But I was just enormously grateful to Mike and every other author for working with the spirit of the enterprise. And so, for example, Mike and his collaborators who wrote the first four chapters of the volume truly had a conversation amongst themselves and produced a volume that I, or produced the beginning of the volume that is absolutely crucial to the book, establishes the tone of the book. But I also think as you read it, You'll be aware that there are four authors, but on the other hand, it's not a jarring contrast between voices or argument. It truly reads like an ongoing story. And that, that was the major goal that we had in mind, to write an accessible history that you could start at the beginning, and we hope the story will pull you through to the end, even though it's a long story and it takes many pages to do it. So Mike, I, I, I wanna, I, I'd like to, for you and I to briefly have a conversation about one of the challenges of the book was working out a definition of what the South was. And I, I, I can speak to a little bit of that, but I'd like to get you on board for you to talk about how you thought of the portion of the, of the, the past that you and your colleagues wrote about and how you all approached thinking about a region that people who lived in the region did not think of as a South necessarily. Sure, thanks very much Fitz um, for the question and for inviting me along to this morning, this morning for my, in my time. And thank you to Malaprops for uh, having me here as well and UNC Press, of course. Uh, and my first book was with UNC Press. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've had a long relationship with a terrific establishment there. Um, as I start, though, I would do like to just quickly uh, acknowledge and pay respect to the Gamaragal people of the Eora Nation here uh, in Sydney, the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I now live, uh, and which were taken from them without their consent, treaty, or compensation. Um, this is an uh, important acknowledgement of country that we do on most formal occasions here in Australia and informal at the beginning of classes and, and uh, lectures uh, and talks like this. And I think it's um, I think there's a, a growing recognition of the value of land acknowledgements in the U.S. as well. Um, I think they've infiltrated via Canada, um, mm -hmm. which is where I grew up. Yeah. And so it's a, a great question, Fitz. Um, because, uh, as I mentioned, I, I, I grew up in Canada. I was born in Wales, um, in the UK, and um, and I came to American history not as an insider but as an outsider and had some great high school teachers in Canada that were interested in American history. And then I went to the University of Ottawa, 
where I had some uh, more great professors in American history. Um, and so I didn't grow up with, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a sort of a school curriculum that emphasized uh, either American history or state history. Um, and, uh, but I was attracted to the American Revolution, um, I suppose as a, as a Canadian high school student, it, it seemed a little bit more dramatic <laughs> and more interesting than uh, simple confederation uh, and the history of confederation in, in Canada. And, um, and so I was interested in the American Revolution. And when I went off to do uh, a PhD, I, um, I really was just fascinated with Virginia and, uh, and particularly kind of, it seemed like a place that, you know, had pulled off a successful revolution in the midst of a, a kind of an enslaved population um, that, uh, that, you know, seemed to go relatively smoothly. So I came at this and of course the PhD ended up uh, uh, unpicking all of those assumptions. But I came at this without any notion, really, of the South. I was interested in the American Revolution. I was interested in colonial America. And as you mentioned, uh, the folks that we studied in colonial America, beginning with indigenous peoples, the, the, the enormous variety of indigenous peoples in the area that became known as the American South, um, few of them would have seen themselves as Southerners. And uh, instead, most of them, uh, at least the, the English speaking uh, uh, invaders, uh, settlers, uh, would have seen themselves as British, uh, uh, simply uh, right up to the time of the revolution. So when, when you asked us to contribute to this history of the South, I think we four uh, early Americanists uh, and, and scholars of indigenous history, we're sort of scratching our heads and thinking, uh, okay, so how do we how do we do this? Um, how do we write a history of the South before effectively the South was created or or was I guess summoned up or imagined or you know whatever way you want to think about the South? Um, so we, uh, we 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 had a number of discussions and they were really fruitful and it was a great collaborative exercise and I'd like to thank you Fitz as well for bringing us together to do that. Um, I knew John Sensbach uh, and I knew the work of James Rice and uh, Robbie Etheridge, but I hadn't met them, and we just had some tremendously fruitful discussions about what the South was and how we might want to frame it when we knew the kind of the import, the importance of kind of establishing a good precedent in that early part of the book mm -hmm. um, in terms of thinking a bit more expansively about what the South was and maybe became. And, um, and because of Robbie, because of uh, uh, James Rice's work and my own work and John's work, where we've all paid attention very much to indigenous peoples and, and enslaved peoples and others who were sort of on the margins and not at the core of that kind of American history narrative. Uh, we, we knew we had to kind of approach this and, 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 and effectively kind of think continentally. So let's try to break away from that kind of uh, westward facing idea of history unfolding from Virginia and Jamestown and, and expanding westward. But rather, we we tried to kind of face east or face east and west from the center. We sort of took cues from Robbie's work and 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 began our kind of sense of this from uh, the Mississippi, and said, okay, what did this place look like to the inhabitants of the people across that broad expanse, and how might that kind of broader definition um, change our, our 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 narratives in our individual chapters? Well, I don't know if I've answered picking your up, question there, Fitz. Picking up on what you said, I, I'd just like to tell the audience that that's it's a really important, as you said, foundation for the rest of the volume. Because as we approach the South collectively, meaning the entire group of authors, our, our assumption wasn't that we were writing a history that would arrive at a moment in time when the South became the South, that somehow there's there's the crystallization of some Southern civilization. And the purpose of the book is to identify that moment and then trace it from that moment. 
Instead, we, our approach is to think of the South as something that we now, it has, it's a kind of vernacular idea that we all take for granted. The American South is something we know exists. And we're not denying that that South that we experience in the present day, it, it, we all agree that it exists, but our thinking about it historically, we want to emphasize the way in which we need to approach the history of the southeastern part of the U.S. continent, taking into account not the origin stories you said in Jamestown and moving westward, but as the story of everyone who lives in that geographical space and tracing that geographical space through time. So our volume isn't a history somehow of a Southern civilization or of a Southern culture. It's really of the people who live in this region and then the meanings, the different histories that those people have compiled. Sometimes those histories are acknowledged by others in the region, sometimes they're not. So I had a question last night where someone asked me, so does your book talk about Southern individualism and various particular character traits? And that's, that's not really what we do. We certainly talk about individualism, but none of us thought of it as a quality that, for example, is exaggerated or particularly distinctive about the South. So that geographical focus uh, you described is very important to the volume. The one other point that I would make, and there, here's where I'd like to sort of get your response to it is, uh, when, we, when we were thinking of the volume and as it was being written, I, it confirmed my idea that it really is hard to think of the South as any sort of the argument about continuity and discontinuity or the emergence of a South and then its perpetuation doesn't really help understand a region that went through such extraordinary upheavals time and time and time again. And I think coming to your work leading up to the revolution, when I encountered the revolution growing up in Virginia, in Virginia textbooks, or when I encountered it even in college, the American Revolution truly did seem like about as good a revolution as you could ever have. Um, the right people led it and they did it in the right way. There wasn't the kind of violence that we associate with rev very many revolutionary societies. But I think it would be fair to say based on your work, that vision of the revolution isn't the vision that, that's not the version of the revolution they will encounter in this book, right? Uh, correct. And yes, and I think we've all come a long way uh, in, in, the, in the last couple of decades, I think, in terms of our scholarship. And certainly it's not, uh, it's not just on me, but I think there's a lot more recognition uh, of the kind of, uh, you know, the difficulties, the challenges, the conflicts. When you bring more people into the picture and into the story, and you think more expansively about the kind of the, the dynamic interplay of those histories, then I think that naturally in some ways leads you to kind of discover much more nuance, much more uh, conflict of interest, uh, many more divisions. And, and you understand that not everyone had the same uh, goals in mind, the same, had the same interests. And I think I think that's what I guess is informed my scholarship. I've always been interested in kind of thinking about different perspectives and uh, and different lives and different communities and how they responded and reacted and and pushed uh, these kind of uh, uh, extraordinary moments of of change and and um, and conflict. Um, and I think that yeah, it's it's really important. Uh, I guess my own research led me to realize that under that kind of gentrified, literally gentrified view of the revolution, um, there was a heck of a lot going on. There were a lot, you know, and it, we've had a generation of scholarship about enslaved people uh, re rebelling and running away and, and joining the British. We now know that they joined the British during the revolution in uh, huge numbers. Um, and And when we start to take that, 
those kind of views. And of course, Native peoples as well had uh, different Native communities had, had had a stake in the conflict and were, you know, playing off each other, playing off the British, the French, the, you know, the, 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 the patriot movements, the loyalists. Um, so there was this really kind of, kind of kaleidoscopic uh, collision of interests in the, in the revolution. And, and I think it's, uh, I think that's, that really does alter kind of our understanding of this smooth, uh, smoothly, you know, nicely kind of affected revolution. And while the kind of the outline of that story might uh, still look similar, we now understand that, you know, while Jefferson was kind of writing about the process of revolution, he was also, you know, absolutely panicked about what, what was kind of going on below. And, and whether there was going to be, uh, whether they were going to be able to pull this off and how they were going to do this. Um, and, and incredibly responsive, right, to, to that turmoil. Um, and I think that's what we have learned over the last couple of decades is, is just how much interplay there was between what was going on below and the kind of the pushes and the different uh, 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 conflicts and how much that was affecting the day-to-day -day decisions of people that we are more familiar with, like the traditional kind of gentry of Virginia. And, and I think but that's yeah. a history that the, the story you're just telling is a story that runs through subsequent chapters and runs up into the 20th century. I, I, I try to think of it in terms of the the strenuousness, the, the labor it took for someone like Jefferson to have the appearance of the control that he had, not just on, at Monticello, but in the state and more thinking sort of nationally in terms of the early Republic. Um, that kind of exercise of authority took so much effort for white Southern elites through the remainder of the history of the South, right up into the 1960s and 1970s, that it is a, uh, a region where it's not only characterized by a lot of upheaval, a lot of tumult, historical change on a truly colossal scale, as the American Civil War is an example, but we could also think of the Americans, the civil rights movement of the 20th century as being truly a remarkable tumult. But the, 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 the energy that was required for the elites to retain their power is a, is a very central part of our story. Well, I want to bring Kirk back in because I know, Kirk, you had some questions you wanted to pose to us. And also, Mike and I could probably end up talking here all night and never let anybody get a word in edgewise. So um, questions that you had, Kirk, that you wanted to ask as well as start letting some of our listeners Chime in. Thanks so much. It's already an engaging conversation. Um, and my mind's teeming with questions, actually. But Fitz, it might be good for those who haven't yet seen the volume to give a sense of the scope. Sure. Um, so you have divided it into three sections. But mm -hmm. if you could tell us a little bit about the 15 chapters that make those up. Sure. So, uh, yes. Uh, uh, one, one of the elements that I've touched on is this was very much a collaborative effort. It wasn't just the, for example, Mike's quote unquote team working on the early period. There's a 19th century team of five historians and a 20th century team as well. So they worked collaboratively amongst themselves, but then collaboratively across the volume. So yes, there are there are four chapters that deal with the early period leading up to the, the era of the American Constitution, I'll, I'll put it that way, to the turn of the 19th century. Five chapters on the 19th century, which move more or less chronologically through that, that long century. And then there are five chapters that deal with the, uh, the 20th century, which overlap with, there's some overlap between some of the chapters in the 19th century and some of the 20th century. The one difference about the 20th century chapters is honestly, we couldn't think of a 
we didn't want to get into decade by decade history of the 20th century. So once we got to the New Deal, roughly the, the, the Great Depression, then we have chapters that move from the 1930s up to the turn of the 21st century um, thematically rather than sort of chronologically. So it is a work that does go from the ancient South as Robbie Etheridge calls it, meaning the pre-contact South, uh, the, the indigenous South, if you will, all the way up to roughly 2000. Uh, so yeah, it does cover, you know, many of the chapters are covering large spans of time, particularly the early historians, they're, they're more used to it than say 20th century historians. But yeah, there's, there's, there's a large sweep of time. So this might not be a fair question to ask, but uh, so there are 15 chapters and they take us from pre-contact uh, to post-World War II Black freedom struggle. If there were a 16th chapter, what would it be? Well, I'll tell you, this partially because it took, it was in gestation a long time. In many ways, I think it's a volume that reflects, well, we're all historians, so we tend to, you know, we're, we tend to deal with events, not con the most contemporary events to begin with. But if we were starting this volume now, I'm confident it would look different in a variety of ways. Hmm. And that's because the events of the last decade have certainly affected my thinking yeah. about the what I think about the American South. And in some ways subtle, but I want to assure your 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 the audience as well that I don't think this is a presentist volume in the sense that I don't think, for example, I know I can speak that when I was writing the introduction, I made a conscious decision to not, for example, engage in the debate about the 2019 project. I mean, you mean the 20, um, 16, yeah, 2019 project. Um, I, I, not that that isn't an important, the controversy surrounding the publication of that report, not that that isn't important and very, very valuable, but I just, I would like to think that somebody will be reading this year book 20 years from now, consulting it maybe, and they'll be like, what was the 2019 pro? They won't know what that was. So to, to, to be more precise, I think it would have been valuable for us to bring the story up to 2010 or 2012. I don't know that we could have gone beyond that, but there are ways that we could have uh, and I think we should have, but I'd be interested to hear because Mike's also got the perspective of being on the other side of the Pacific, thinking about this. Yeah, I, I, I would, as a, as a lowly contributor, Fitz, I would push you to, to be more presentist. Um, and, uh, and, 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 yeah, I, I do think that, you know, it, it would be great if we could write another chapter um, and and because I do think that the kind of the kind of conversations that uh, historians and the public have had in the last few years about history, about the framing of history and framing of politics, um, I, I think that 1619 Project will be remembered in 20 years, and I think it will be a part, an important part of the way that we think about this this most recent era of, of heated conversations about history and, and, and the use of history. And I think, I guess when I say presentist, you know me, Fitz. Uh, yeah. you, um, um, it's, I, I think that, you know, it is really important to acknowledge that kind of, um, the, the, the heated conflicts over the way that we use the past. And I think, you know, the history of the South has been a, you know, a political football for for many years. And that is also part of the story. And I think, yeah. uh, I think, I think we, I, I, I would, you know, as you say, it's kind of, we were, we were try desperately, you know, emerging from the pandemic and just trying to hang on to our sanity and, and, and get the volume over the line. 
but it would not, and, and this is not, of course, to take away from the value of the book as it stands, but it, 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 I think it would have been great if we could have had a kind of a reflective yeah. discussion um, and maybe kind of an epilogue or a conclusion to that, to the volume, uh, in light of what's happened. Yeah, and, and, and the interesting thing is the volume in, in many ways uh, was addressing the same things that the 1619 project was addressing. And we were talking about the same things, in fact, before that project came into existence, um, because that's what the many historians were doing. And so you're certainly right there. It's present there and we could have brought it to the foreground in ways, um, but with every book I've ever worked on, you always wish you could write it a second time. And then of course, you also don't want to write it a second time. <laughs> uh, well, and I'm also looking on, Yeah. sorry, I, I, I also loving these, you know, the tweets that I read about people saying, oh, I just at 2.30 this afternoon, I finished the, the last sentence on the manuscript and, and the, the book is finished. And I never get that sense. I just right. like, oh, this will have to do for, for now. And uh, I'll send it off. And I hope I get to change a little bit later. <laughs> yeah, Kirk, your question's kind of unfair because oh, it's yeah. not unfair, but it's it's sort of like asking a musician after a concert, how was your performance? <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. it was good, but it could have been better. Well, I think what, what um, is behind that question is wondering what you learned along the way that informed uh, not only the final product as we see it now, but also might beg uh, future iterations. So uh, I just encourage, I, I don't want you to close the book on the book, I guess right. is what I'm saying. I, I wanted to make one last comment and then turn things back over to you, Stephanie, if that's okay. Um, I was so struck at the sensitivity of the, of the introduction, uh, your willingness to wrestle with different definitions of the past or, or of the South, excuse me, uh, past definitions and the messiness of all of that. But then ultimately to come to this statement, which I think is, uh, sums up so much of the volume. Our focus in this volume is not on identifying a litany of characteristics that can be assigned to the South, but rather to exploring the clustered interactions between people and institutions that gave historical salience to the concept of the South. And to me, there's so much that's rooted in relationship there that I, I, I very much appreciate. Um, well, I'll, and with that- I'll just add here quickly then, Jake. Uh, and in, in, in my own way, uh, I'm sort of like Mike in that uh, I, I moved around a lot in my childhood, but my mother was from Virginia. And so I had these Virginia roots. So I was, but I was from Northern Virginia. And when I encountered people from the deep South, you know, I didn't grow up eating moon pies and drinking RC Cola. I, I've actually never had, I'm a vegetarian, but I've never had North Carolina barbecue in my life. So there are a whole lot of things that I've never done that are part of being a Southerner. And so I've always looked on the South as somebody from, and Mike would know what this means, growing up in a certain part of Virginia. Um, and, and that's certainly part of the South. These are people, my, my ancestors looked to Philadelphia. They didn't look, they looked to Philadelphia and Charleston. They didn't look to Montgomery, Alabama. So I only mention that because in many ways, when I think about the South, I think of this incredibly variegated place with all these different people claiming their identity as Southerner. But if you got them in a room and asked me, asked them what that definition of a Southerner was, you'd have a heck of an argument. Whether or not it's East, Eastern North Carolina barbecue or Western or Hickory barbecue and many other debates. So yeah, let's go to the, let's go to the questions. Um, not that I want to interrupt anything else that's happening here, but we do have a couple of um, uh, audience questions. And one of our questioners in the in the audience, um, 
actually typed this question in before you started talking about, before Kirk asked this question that brought you into talking about um, um, the present is present ism <laughs> in the book. Um, and her question, Patricia, not our Patricia, but a Patricia who we've seen before says, how does, how does today's South compare to previous eras of the South? Are there any issues or leaders that are similar to those in the past? Gosh, that's a tough question. That is a tough question. Yeah, our audiences are, are often good pretty question. good at that. <laughs> right, yeah. Let me let me take a very brief stab at this, and then I'm going to let Mike have the fun with this question. It's a great question. I'll just offer an experience from I've been at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill now two decades. When I first came here, the student body was very different than the student body I'm currently teaching. The student body that I'm currently teaching is so much more diverse in ethnic origins, in national origins, in, uh, so we say, families, educational experience. Uh, it's just a, it's a very, very different population. And I think that reflects the enormous transformation in many areas of the South. But you can also go to other areas of the South where you won't see that comparable diversity of people of all sorts of backgrounds. And so to my way of thinking, like in much of the United States, I think they're in some ways the most striking thing to me about the South now is the kind of two Americas that are present in the South. There's the bubble that I live in, which is the triangle bubble, which is cosmopolitan and filled with economic growth and in migration. Um, and then a hundred miles to the East, there's a very different demographic, environmental, economic landscape. And the distance between the two is very small like in many other areas of the US. And so I think that is, that's a, um, a different South than uh, I would have re I, I recognized until you go way back, but I'll throw it over to, to Mike. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I've, I'm, my mind is, is doing cartwheels, I think right now, thinking about um, possible answers. But I guess I would say that um, in some ways, I, I guess I would, draw some parallels and similarities, right? I mean, the process of change that Fitz just talked about in terms of just the student body, right, is, is something that I think gets emphasized throughout this volume, which is the kind of the constant and constant change and the kind of upheaval of change and the, and the kind of the dynamics of, uh, you know, the, 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 the wonderful stories that Fitz tells in the introduction about people whose lives, you know, were just kind of upended and changed and, uh, and uh, you know, over their lifetime. So, so there was never kind of a static South that, um, and, and I think that's very much true today, right? It's, you know, there, there's, there's still a lot of change, perhaps unevenly in different places, uh, but, but the change is there. But I would also say that um, I guess that, the, the, the kind of the elusiveness of the South is still similar because as Fitz was alluding to, yeah, we can say this is the South, but then someone from Western North Carolina would say, no, 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 that's not the South. And someone from, you know, the, the, the Mississippi Delta would say, you guys are crazy. Um, and I think that kind of ongoing elusiveness <laughs> it's like nailing jelly to the wall, right? It's, you know, ah, there is, we know there's a South, but how do we actually define this? And I think, I think I think that kind of constellation of interest, if we look close enough, it is incredibly diverse place. I mean, Fitz talked about two, two kinds of representations, but, but of course, the deeper we dig, the more we uncover, uh, you know, multiplicity of viewpoints and people and interests who would all define the South quite differently and uh, and differently from each other. And in terms of 
leadership. Yeah, I, you know, again, I, I really think it's important to look beyond the the loudest people um, and and to really think about the kind of local communities and how much they are getting shaped. And, and of course, we see the tip of the iceberg in, in the kind of the debates over school board and, and school school curriculums, which to an Australian seems, you know, like crazy, right? <laughs> um, but, but of course, you know, communities, local communities are shaping their, their own lives and their own sense of their relationship with other Southerners and with the nation in very particular and different ways that, that we as historians and, and, and others need to kind of dig and think about and dig for and look for and, and understand uh, that, that relationship between the kind of the loudmouth leaders and the, and, the, and the locals. Well, what you just said is a, is a perfect segue into our next question, um, which is a bit about loudmouth leaders. So you may <laughs> want to sit it out, but um, it's from Elizabeth Kostova. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, who, in addition to being a, a wonderful writer, is is also um, on the UNC Press Advancement Council. Um, and uh, so Elizabeth says, did the outcome of the election of 2016 take you by surprise as editors, writers, given what you were putting together in the book? Or did it surprise you less given your work in the region? I was dumbfounded. Uh, I there was nothing that prepared me uh, as a historian to understand what happened in 2016 at, at the national level. What has been happening regionally within the South? was something that I, I don't want to say was prescient because I wasn't really, but it was something that worried me and that I addressed at the end of a previous book I wrote called The Southern Past. And I was very worried about the politicization of Southern identity and Southern culture, particularly the meaning of the Southern past. And in 2000, when I was writing that book, there were still... It, it, the partisan lines over the meaning of the Southern past and something like the Confederate battle flag, they were starting to form, but they were not by any means what they have since become. And so particularly in, in many ways, what happened in 2016 in the South, I saw as predictable given what happened in 2008 and 2012, 2010 and 2012. But at the national level, no, that that I, I never anticipated that. And I'll certainly say I never anticipated nothing in my historical scholarship uh, prepared me for what happened on January 6th um, of uh, 2021. It was, no, 2022, sorry. I get my, um, what? I'm a historian. I'm not good with dates, but you know what? I'm January sticks. The nothing. Is That's why we use Wikipedia. That's why we use Wikipedia. Exactly. In any case, so uh, yes, I was I was caught off guard by by many things nationally, but the direction of the South politically as a region hasn't surprised me that much. Can I can I just jump in and and say something maybe controversial? Uh, and Fitz, you know that I'm happy to try. Um, Good. Uh, I, I, I guess I was. I guess I was not as surprised. I think. I mean, obviously, I was surprised. I'm not going to say I told you so. I told you so. But uh, uh, I, I was a little less surprised in part because of my understanding of the revolutionary era, mm -hmm. and and my own sort of uh, interpretation that's built on, on a, you know a number of scholars who have looked at the revolutionary era, and looked at the. The, the turmoil of the Revolutionary War and the uh, kind of really vast range of kind of political solutions um, that were implemented at the state level in the state constitutions during the war and under the pressure of the Revolutionary War and the 
the the vast problems of that, that kind of uh, nascent nation, 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 uh, nation, nation. Uh, that you know that 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 you know that didn't have the kind of executive power to uh, prosecute a war successfully, and that's why it dragged on for eight years, and that's why it was conscription in every state. That's why there was conflict over uh, you know just about every step of that that war. That's why it was almost lost at, at several points. And then there was a post-war depression, a massive post-war depression that we now know, and scholars have been uncovering the contours of that. And, and so rather than a nation forged in fire, the nation and the federal constitution was forged in the aftermath of this horrible, terrible fire in many ways, and was a reaction to the kind of uh, more democratic impulses of the revolution, where people demanded something, a return on, on their service if they did serve. They wanted more democratic governments. And we know that the founding fathers now kind of launched almost what we call a counter-revolution and created a government that removed the kind of the, the power from the people in, in a, in, in, to a, a great extent. And it meant that someone who was going to be elected to that federal government and elected to the presidency was going to have to be a very wealthy, very loud uh, 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 person, right? So, in some ways, Trump is the person down the family fathers would never have imagined a Trump coming to the presidency. That's not who they wanted, but they would never have imagined someone like Trump having as much money and kind of uh, you know popular influence through the media, uh, you know, in in their life. So, in some sense. The founding fathers wanted someone with a lot of money, a lot of wealth, kind of a lot of distance, if you like, from, from the people. Uh, and I think controversial, I think that's in some ways what the founders, if Trump is what the founders had created. Sorry. I'm going to get in trouble for that. I know, but no. Well, I, 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 this is a reminder for all of us why it's so valuable, of course, to have a historian offer perspective from their period. But it's also why it's so valuable for us to have someone, for example, like an Australian by way of Canada and Wales and South Africa and all the other places Mike has lived to have that perspective. And I'll just throw out here, Mike, just as a counterpart, I wasn't surprised by Brexit at all. I have English friends who were so disappointed by Brexit. And I was like, I could see that coming from a thousand miles away, almost literally. Um, so that's where that sometimes being outside of society can make you a little bit more perceptive than those in within it. So that's that's that was I found that very fascinating, Mike. Yeah, thank you both for that. Kirk, did you have something to add? No, 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 nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also not touching that. It's not my job to, but you know, where I'm so blind, do, I won't. Do we do we have any other questions or? I do. We have one more, um, okay. and hopefully Mike's battery will last. Um, uh, we're it's a little bit of a little bit of a theme here. Another another probing question. Kevin asks: Many individuals identify as Southern, quote unquote, or having quote unquote Southern values. Can you speak to how these sensibilities or identities inform the emergence of a new American nationalism? It's just the lighthearted stuff tonight, y'all. <laughs> I, my question there is new American nationalism. Is that, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I know what that means. I think because it's, you know, uh, uh, because it's typed into chat, you, you can interpret what it means. And then, and then if it's, if you're way off, Kevin can, can okay. type in and say, well, I was gonna say that's not what I meant. Well, okay. Well, that, cause I was thinking that we have, Senator Tommy Tuberville from Alabama, who's talking about uh, what I, I, I think would call themselves new American nationalists who are right wing advocates of white supremacy who um, 
are, are advocates of a particular type of nationalism, or are we talking about a more pluralistic nationalism? And let me just speak to both of those very quickly and then definitely throw this one to Mike. Um, with regards to um, a kind of pluralist idea of American nationalism, I think uh, one of the striking things about the history of the South is going back to, for example, Mike talking about early American history, the South was an incredibly heterogeneous, complicated population. And yet it's a region that was never, I would say the leadership of the region, the people who wanted to exert control were never comfortable with pluralism. And especially in the 19th and 20th century, managed to suppress pluralism to an extraordinary degree. And in fact, they shaped the nation in many ways to enable them to do that. So that the coexistence of pluralism and a sense of American national identity has always been very awkward. And it has become less awkward since the American civil, since the civil rights movement of the 1960s, which has transformed ideas of citizenship. But we are now in the present day really working through what a pluralist nation will look like. And the South has struggled mightily to ever deal with pluralism, which gets me back to the this kind of the present day right wing American nationalism, which of course can, bury, can borrow so much from the heritage of white supremacist thought in the American South. I mean, it can just vacuum up a lot of it and can embrace, for example, the lost cause, can import kind of Confederate white nationalism into its, into its version of history as well. So in its own way, I think whether the emergence of a pluralist American nationalism or the emergence uh, or the continuation of a vision of a much more um, white supremacist nationalism have deep roots in ideas that were generated in the American South. Um, if we've just got time, I'll just quickly jump in. I also think that uh, I think Fitz is bang on about the kind of the tension between pluralism and the and the kind of the rhetoric, right? Of that 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 you know the political rhetoric that that people that leaders wanted to, to use to shape um, uh, the identity and, and and nationhood. But I also think that pluralism is you know is that also key to kind of dampening dampening down down that nationalism right because because again what south are we talking about to, even today you know again we we tend to point towards the kind of the loudest the, the ones that amplify voice on social media that on on fox news but you know go to atlanta and stand on a street corner and start asking people what they think of you know of nationalism and and southernness and and we're going to get a tremendous variety of views just on that street corner and then if we amplify that across the region so again i yeah it's a really interesting tension at the moment between that pluralism and that the rhetoric that is trying to kind of uh uh, uh mobilize um a, a single vision but it's, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm not sure how successful it can and will be on the ground. We, we may still end up with Trump in 2024, but again, the kinds of uh, uh, changes in people's communities, I think are, are still, we need to really have close, a much closer look to kind of think about that sense of nationalism and, and what, what, what people think about that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you both. Uh, thoughtful answers to all of those, uh, to all of these sort of tough questions. And um, I mean, part of what the book does, obviously, as you've as you've discussed too, is look at everyone in the South as opposed to just the the people that will pop to mind who have had statues erected mm -hmm. um, to them, uh, for instance, and. Um, who I'll just go ahead and say it, who look like all of you, but not me, right? 
And so, <laughs> um, or some other people who are just as much a part of the entire, the entire history of, you know, this region of the country, you know. Um, and, and so that, and that's, that's something so fundamentally um, just wonderful about the book um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's needed. Um, there's, there's a, and, and there, there is a lot of, we've been talking about this a lot. There is also a lot of present work being done around what, what is, who, who really is part of this region and has been written out of the story, but going back further and, and looking wider into that uh, as well, I think is, um, yeah, that's a, it's a wonderful thing to have done. So really appreciate your thoughtful answers to those questions and the work that you've done. Um, and so we are at a minute to seven and um, uh, Elizabeth chimed in and, and Kevin, by the way, says, thanks, enjoyed the response. So um, the way you address the nationalism question, well done. Um, and uh, Elizabeth chimed in with another question. If you have a minute, <laughs> Quick question. Is the idea of a new American nationalism different for different generations living today? Another great question. Like you've, so Fitz, you talked about a couple of different ways to look at it, um, but that brings to mind something else. And of course, this work that you've done is looking at, you know, such a broad spectrum of perspectives around how, when people are born, color, how they perceive things, right? So um, if you, would you like to tackle that in a minute or so? I'll try to do it in 30 seconds. Excellent. And then give Mike 30 seconds and uh, I'm counting. Um, first thing I'd say is I think that's a great question. And generationally, I think there's a huge difference. And I'll just say that uh, looking at my own son, there is a frustration and impatience. Mm -hmm. that it's not partisan. Uh, although it could be that, but there is a frustration and impatience and a sense that things need to be fixed that is so intense uh, in, in him and his friends that I, I think it is very different than, than for, for that generation, say, than, than others. So yes, I think generationally, there's a, that's very true. And, and I would just say quickly, and I would echo that as a as father of uh, a 16 year old and a and 12 going on 13 year old, um, you know, the kind of the, you know, the, 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 the level of intensity of kind of, uh, you know, critical eye on things is pretty amazing. And that, I, you know, and I think that's what, you know, maybe one of the positive things about social media is, is this awareness. But I will also say that my wife uh, grew up in uh, just pre-apartheid South Africa. I uh, was a university student just as apartheid was breaking up. And we've, you know, long maintained links with uh, extended family there. And it is pretty extraordinary to see the changes that younger people have been able to affect in terms of social relationships in South Africa. And um, I think that's a pretty hopeful sign too, that, um, you know, the young people, I know we, we give them a hard time a lot uh, these days, but um, they are uh, a pretty extraordinary group who, who are on the move and on the march and, um, and, and willing to cross barriers and, and, and make changes. Yeah, for sure. Thank you all so much. Um, I just want to end by um, giving you the opportunity to, to share any final thoughts um, and uh, before we thank the audience and, and say good night. Um, so, I'm sorry the hour's over. I know, it went very quickly. <laughs> um, I would any, just like to say else? thank you very much for, I'd like to say thank you very much for having me and uh, for, for thinking of me on the margins here uh, and uh, and making it possible. And also thank you for your good work in the bookshops as well. Uh, I love independent shops and, uh, and, and very pleased to be a part of this uh, because they're fundamental, uh, fundamentally important. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanna thank both of you uh, as contributor, as editor, for challenging us. And for challenge, as I think you said at the end of the introduction, Fitz, uh, challenging the verities that we had grown up with. 
to allow for something new to emerge. It's a wonderful thank evening. You. And thank you to everyone for, for listening to us, joining us. Well, I echo Kirk in that. Um, thanks again for, for the conversation um, and, the, and the work that you've done. And to everyone who's been with us, thank you again for your time. We hope to see you some other time in any way that it's possible for you. Um, and thank you, Kirk. There's the book, A New History of the American South. Uh, on our shelves now, on shelves all over independent bookstores. Um, uh, and uh, so we appreciate your support um, of us and of uh, Fitz and Michael and everybody who contributed to this book. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Please stay safe and well until we see you again. Good night. Good night.